Thank you, Charlotte. I'm just going to start by wishing you all here and at home on the stream a very happy new year. Uh, it's 2021, and doesn't it feel such a relief to, to say that 2020 is over? <laughs> it's done. It's, it's gone. It's in the past. It's history. Because 2020 was a very difficult year, wasn't it? Uh, I've uh, made a list of some of the news highlights, or lowlights really, from, from the last year. So let's just refresh ourselves what it was like. So right at the beginning of the year, don't know if you remember, but uh, a top Iranian general was killed in a US drone strike, which caused massive tension. Uh, there were devastating bushfires in Australia and on the west coast of the USA. Uh, Hurricane Laura hit Louisiana, which was apparently the, the strongest hurricane ever to do so. We had the killing of George Floyd, sparking protests across the world. We had mass protests against the Chinese government in Hong Kong. We had a huge explosion in Beirut. We had the largest global recession since the Great Depression in the 1930s. There, there were civil wars in Libya, Yemen, Syria, and Somalia, along with conflict in Ethiopia and a massacre in Nigeria. And the American president refusing to accept the result of a democratic election. And on top of that, there was a pandemic that killed over 1.8 million people worldwide. That's one word you could use to describe 2020 is dark. Dark enough for Netflix to put out a film called Death to 2020. <laughs> a sentiment that is echoed among a lot of people. This morning's passage is a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. Uh, the prophecy is to the people of Israel, people who he describes as living in darkness and in great distress. This was written about 700 years before Jesus came when the kingdom of Israel was split in two, there was division, and it wasn't long before they were going to be taken into exile in Babylon, which was basically Israel's 2020. Okay, it was a lot worse for them than 2020 was for us. It was an awful time. But even though things were dark for them, and they were about to get even darker, this prophecy came, and it brings real hope. It talks about a light being revealed. And that's my first point, the light revealed. Let's read verses 1 and 2 again. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Light is great. It's essential for life. Plants get energy from it and give out oxygen, which we then breathe. Without light, we would all die. It's also great for our mental well-being, and it lets you see what's around you. I don't know how much time you've spent in the woods, but I grew up on the edge of some really, really beautiful woods. And in the daytime, they're, they're one of my absolute favorite places to be. It's beautiful. The range of trees, the sun coming through the gaps, the, the, the deer that you can just about see, the birds you can hear. It's a magnificent place. But at night, it completely transforms to a place that feels close and oppressive, and you don't know what's making that noise over there, and it becomes a very unpleasant place to be. You, just, you find yourself longing for just a glimpse of light, even the light on the, the torch on your phone is some comfort. Not much, but some comfort. And over the last year, in the 
darkness of 2020, how much did we long for glimpses of light? The collective joy when vaccines were approved, when the Oxford vaccine was approved just in the last week or so. Maybe for you it was the return of live sport. I know that was a huge lift to lots and lots of people. Or maybe, like me, it was Taylor Swift dropping two albums, which are great if you haven't listened to them. Little glimpses of light that just gave us a little bit of hope that it wasn't all that bad. But in this passage, this light doesn't just give a glimpse of hope. This is totally transformative. This light means there will be no more gloom ever, permanently, for all eternity. So what is this permanent light that will last for all eternity? Well, for the answer to that, let's skip forwards from this uh, prophecy 700 odd years to the book of John. So John 1 says this, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. This passage is talking about the one whose birth we just celebrated over Christmas, Jesus. The light is Jesus, the one who is God himself, through whom everything was created. The one who came to earth to live as a man and to die on the cross. He is the light revealed. And you see in that passage, the true light that gives light to everyone. Jesus, this light revealed, wasn't just revealed to Israel. He was revealed to the whole world, to everyone. And he gives life not by giving energy to plants who then give us oxygen. He came to give life in a totally different and far superior way. Look at those last verses again. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. See, he came to make those who believe in his name children of God. That's how he gives life. He brings us and anyone who believes in his name into the most incredible inheritance, not one that will fade away, not one that will depreciate in value, but eternal life with God forever. And that's not something we could ever earn or achieve on our own. That is something that we only have the right to because Jesus came and died for us. Looking at this passage, we obviously have the beauty of hindsight, but 700 years before Jesus was born, when this was written, they didn't. So in the next verses, God shows the promises fulfilled by him. That's my second point, is the promises fulfilled by God. See, he was showing them that they could trust this prophecy, they could trust this promise of the light. Let's read verses 3 and 4 again. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. See, what this part of the prophecy is doing is showing God's faithfulness to his promises that he'd made to his people in the past. God promised Abraham, the father of all Israel, that he would make him into a great nation. Uh, let's look at a couple of verses in Genesis 12. It's God saying to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great 
and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So here he's pointing out that actually that's been achieved. They are a great nation, and they are growing, and will continue to grow. And he also points out the, the day of Midian's defeat. So this was a time when God delivered his people, Israel, from their oppressor, the Midianites. The whole story is in Judges 6 to 8. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but to give you an idea of what kind of situation they were in, this is from the beginning. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza, and did not spare a living thing for Israel neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their cam camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. See, the Israelites, God's people, had turned against him. And because of that, they were invaded by this other people, the Midianites, who were foreign, had foreign gods, and they totally trampled all over Israel, not letting them have anything. So the point where they had to hide in caves, and any time they planted crops, they were destroyed. But God raised up a man called Gideon, and with just 300 men, he Oh, God helped him to overthrow the Midianites and release Israel from their captivity. See, this was God fulfilling his promise to be faithful to Israel, even when they hadn't been faithful to him. So let me ask you, who is it easier to trust? Would you trust someone who sometimes keeps their promises? Would you trust someone who never keeps their promises? Or would you trust someone who always keeps their promises? You'd obviously trust the person who always keeps their promises, wouldn't you? And these verses are God reminding his people that he always keeps his promises. And there's promises throughout the Bible that God has kept. And I would encourage you to have a look, if you don't believe me, have a look for yourself. Go to sign up for Christianity Explored to see some of them, because there are so many times when God has kept his promises to his people. But then God makes another promise in this prophecy, doesn't he? It's a promise of a bright future, and that's my third point, is our bright future that's ahead of us. Let's read verses 5 to 7 again. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So having established God's faithfulness to his promises in the past, he makes this promise, which is a huge promise, isn't it? It's a promise that a, a ruler, a king, will come who will see an end to all war, to all injustice, and will reign forever perfectly in justice and righteousness. 
And again, with hindsight as 21st century Christians, we can see that fulfilled in Jesus. A child is born, a son is given. We just celebrated that at Christmas. And it says he'll reign on David's throne. And we've just been working through Matthew's gospel in his account of Christmas. And that starts with these words. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And goes on to give a family tree showing the royal line from King David to King Jesus, showing that he is the heir to the throne. And then when the Magi visit in chapter 2, they ask this, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? This is God's King, Jesus. He is the light revealed to the world that God promised 700 years earlier. He is the king that God promised to his people 700 years earlier. And he's not just king for the Israelites, for the Jews. He came to be a light for everyone. Now, I could go on for a long time about the titles that are given to Jesus here. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I'll spare you that this morning. But the important thing is this. He is a loving, caring, all-powerful, divine, eternal king who brings an end to war and violence and injustice. But all of this begs the question, the difficult question that is... If this prophecy has been fulfilled and this perfect king, this light for the whole world, has come and is ruling in justice and righteousness, why does the world still feel so dark? 2020 was a dark year for a lot of people. And as Christians, we're not excluded from that. It was a difficult year for us. So how come it was so dark when this light, this king, is ruling? Well, Jesus did come about 2,000 years ago, and he did achieve what he set out to do, to give those who believe in his name the right to become children of God. But he's coming again to make all things new. He is reigning now. He is the perfect king and he is on the throne. But there is still sin and suffering wherever we look. Because the hard truth is that we, like the Israelites when they were occupied by Midian, have turned away from God. We keep turning away from God. That's why we confess every Sunday our sins because we need to keep turning back to him, because we keep turning away from him. But like it says in Isaiah, there will be a day when every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. There will be a day when Jesus will establish and uphold his kingdom with justice and righteousness forever. So, my challenge to you this morning is this. Are you living like that's the case? Or are you still living in gloom, in darkness? Of course, we should be concerned about the millions of people dying from COVID. And we should be concerned about the damage that's being done to the environment. We should. Our hearts should break when we see famine and oppression and war. But are we living in darkness, being pessimistic and frankly miserable because we're looking at the things that are right in front of us? The continued pandemic, the continued lockdown, the fact that we still can't sing in church, we still can't 
just, just hang out with our friends and see our families? Are we looking at those things instead of looking at the big picture, our bright future that God has promised us? Now, let me be very clear here. I am not saying that you need to be happy every single second of every day. That is unrealistic. We are in a broken world still. Until Jesus comes, that won't be the case. And if you suffer from depression or anxiety or another mental illness, those are very real and do make it hard to see the big picture. And I just want you to know that you are no less of a Christian. You are no less loved. You are still so loved by God even though it is, it can be a lot harder to see the big picture, see, keep focused on that light. And of course, looking at the big picture will not make that go away. That will still be there. But I hope that this can be a comfort to you. But are we, all of us, Focusing on what's directly in front of us instead of looking ahead to God's amazing promises to us of such a bright future. God has shown us time and time and time again how faithful he is to his promises. He doesn't forget a single one. He fulfills all of them. And he's already shown us that this prophecy, this promise in Isaiah is trustworthy and true by sending Jesus the first time to be that light and to give us the right to become children of God. Yes, we are in a time of waiting now. We are waiting, longing for Jesus to come again so we can live in perfect peace under his perfect rule. And yes, life is hard. We live in a broken world. But are we living in gloom, in darkness, when the light has already come? Are we miserable when we should be rejoicing? God promised life-giving light to those in darkness. That light was revealed in Jesus. God showed his faithfulness to his promises in the entire history of his people. And his promises are fulfilled in Jesus. And all that means we have a very bright future to look forward to. The world is broken. It seems dark. But Jesus is coming again to fix everything and to establish his kingdom with justice and righteousness for all eternity. And as Christians, as children of God, we can really cling to that. So as we begin this new year, 2021, I'm not going to say it can't be any worse than last year. I'm not going to say this is our year because I cannot see the future. I don't know what's going to happen this year. But what I will say is that let's spend this year and every subsequent year until Jesus comes again, keeping focused on, on that, on him on our bright future, on the future promised to us. And let's rejoice in that. Let's, let's not live in darkness. Let's live in the light. And of course, that is often easier said than done. But I want you to know you are not alone. We all have times when this is very difficult to do. But we have a family here at Grace Church Cowley. You have Christian brothers and sisters. So I would encourage you to pray with each other. Be open with each other about this. And if you don't have anyone to pray to, then I'm sure Ben would be very happy to pray with anyone. I would be very happy to pray with anyone. So sadly, we can't do that after the service today um, because we're in tier four. But please, please do get in touch with, with someone, anyone to pray together. Let's keep our focus on that future ahead. Let's pray now. Loving Father, thank you so much that all your promises are fulfilled in Jesus. 
thank you that by his coming and living and dying for us, you have given us the right to be called children of God, given us access to an incredible inheritance that we could never earn. Help us to live in light of that. Help us to be joyful and to rejoice in the sure and certain hope that we have because Jesus came for us. In Jesus' name, amen.